Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Seth Stevens Davidowitz about the power of search data to indicate health trends and social behavior, public perception of disease, the impact of environment on child development, and the relationship between attractiveness and happiness. Seth, welcome. I'm really glad to have you here. Glad to be here, Spencer. So the first topic I want to talk to you about is what we can learn about people from search data. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of, I wrote this book three years ago, Everybody Lies, and I'd run a whole bunch of New York Times pieces and a couple academic papers, kind of based on the idea that people are really, really honest in their searches. So they tell things, particularly Google's, I, I mostly start Google searches, they tell things to Google that they don't tell other people. So a big problem with kind of the main way to understand people's surveys is that sometimes people lie to surveys. So they, there's something called social desirability bias. People kind of don't say what they're really thinking or really going to do or the, the reasons they do things. Uh, they don't have an incentive to tell the truth, but on Google searches, they tend to be really, really honest. They'll tell you their sexual desires or their racist thoughts or their mental health problems uh, or, you know, all kinds of kind of sensitive topics struggles that people don't usually talk about uh, in polite company. And it can get, give you kind of, in my, my mind, a much more accurate view of the human psyche, kind of an unprecedented window into the human psyche. Uh, so that, yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of the thesis of, I'd say, most of my, my uh, per adult life career. Yeah, it's just a cool way of looking at human nature. Uh, and, I, and I think especially when it comes to interviews that were done by, let's say, a psychologist who's you know, talking to a person face to face, it just seems it's going to be so full of like the common social biases, like not wanting to look bad or not wanting to feel embarrassed. Um, I've even heard of cases where this was used kind of unscrupulously where, you know, let's say you, you're testing a drug and you don't want it to look bad. Instead of asking the patient, like, did you suffer from this symptom? Uh, let's say like some kind of a sexual problem. You just, you just say only if the, if the patient actually brings it up, do you count it as the symptom? And so, you know, how many people are just going to bring up the sexual problem with their doctor? Like probably most people don't do that. Uh, and so you can kind of you know, craft the data to look the way you want. Um, to what extent do you think this is a big problem with anonymous surveys, though? Do you think people are lying on those? I think there, there's, some there's some line. There's also an issue that people lie to themselves. So if you ask people kind of before an election, are you going to vote? Uh, many more people say they're going to vote than actually go out to vote in the election. And they may not deliberately be lying in that situation. They may think they're going to vote, but then they don't get around to it. Uh, and actually, I've shown that you can predict with much higher accuracy uh, where voting rates are going to be high by Google searches, how to vote, where to vote, polling places. That's much more predictive than asking people to vote. So even though it's an anonymous survey, uh, you know, people think they're going to vote. Well, to some degree, Google searches know them better uh, than they know themselves. And I think there are times uh, where people do uh, lie deliberately, even on an anonymous survey, just because they don't feel any need to tell the truth. So, you know, if a survey asks you, are you racist or did you not like Barack Obama because he's black? Uh, I think, you know, some people may in their heart of heart know that they had an issue with Obama's race, uh, but they don't feel comfortable telling Gallup or Pew or Quinnipiac, uh, even though the survey is anonymous, uh, that, that they, they had that attitude. Kind of why, why, kind of why, why admit that? To, uh, there, there's no reason to admit that. Uh, so I think that can lead to kind of uh, full on deception, uh, even in anonymous surveys. Right, so it seems like there's two advantages that you're pointing at for, for stuff like search data. One is that there's a real incentive, to be honest, because you're actually trying to get an answer to a question, right? There's a reason you're doing the search. Uh, the second is that you're actually tracking a real behavior. Like someone might say, yes, I'm going to vote, but an even better indication is that they actually are searching for where the polling center is. So there's, it's a behavior rather than just a report of belief. Is that how you think about it? Yeah, that's exactly it. And also you keep the data over time. So people change over time. Like one of my first studies was analyzing races in the United States. And I looked at searches for kind of N-word jokes. And that includes data from, you know, some people may have made those searches six, seven months ago. Uh, so they might be correct in saying, I don't, I don't make those searches now, but they still probably have the same, those same attitudes. Uh, so kind of keeping that behavior over time, people kind of forget uh, who they were or what they did. Uh, and so that's another, I think, advantage of, of the search data. Mm -hmm. And do you see there being downsides to using the search data? Like, like, for example, is there a challenge around like, well, 
not everyone who wants to do a thing or believes a thing is going to bother searching. And so maybe the people who search are not always representative of the people who have that belief. Yeah, there are definitely disadvantages to search data. So uh, kind of one thing, just, just about everybody I, I tell the idea with or read my book asked me is, you know, well, I made a search for something horrible and I don't have that attitude. I was just curious or I was working on a research paper. Uh, so, you know, certainly when I was writing my book, I was doing a section on racism. So I searched for N-word jokes because I needed to know kind of what came up. Some social scientist is now studying you and being like, this is the most racist person we've ever encountered. We've never seen someone search so many racist search terms. Yeah. I always say that people are like, would, it be, would you be embarrassed if someone released your Google searches? And I think I'm, I'm, I'd be the only one who'd be okay because I could legitimately claim every embarrassing search was for research purposes. Uh, so 80, 80 or 90% of the embarrassing searches really were for research purposes. And the 10 to 20% that weren't, uh, I could just claim they were. Kind of it's an excellent smokescreen. To hide yeah. <laughs> there, there actually was a, apparently a plugin at one point that would do hundreds and hundreds of random Google searches with the idea that it would mask any real searches you were doing. So if a company was monitoring your search traffic, they would never know what you were really searching. But then, of course, the problem with that is that this random thing that's just searching random terms might search like donkey sex or something. And suddenly you're like, no, 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 that wasn't me searching it, really. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so another issue is that kind of people sometimes don't search exactly. They search for general things that don't tell you exactly how they feel about a topic. So everyone's saying, can you use searches to predict who someone's going to vote for? And kind of the first initial approach is using Google searches. We're like, let's just see how frequently each candidate is searched. So is Trump searched more than Biden? And a big problem with this is that searching for Trump or Biden doesn't tell you how you feel about that candidate. You might search for Trump because you love, it, love Trump, or you might search for Trump because you hate Trump. Uh, and same, same with Biden. Uh, I actually found there kind of the, there's kind of this subtle indicator that's pretty, pretty fun, although I don't think it's going to work in this election for, for, for various reasons. But like you could actually predict uh, with decent accuracy which one, way someone's going to vote based on the order in which they put the candidate. So for example, a lot of people search like Trump Biden polls or Biden Trump polls. Uh, and it's, it's very clear that the candidate goes, that, that the, ca uh, the, ca the candidate going first is much more, uh, the people who go Biden are much more likely to, to put Biden first. People who support Biden are much more likely to say Biden Trump polls or Biden Trump debate. People who go Trump are much more likely to say Trump Biden debate, Trump Biden polls. That's It's, it's kind of interesting the, the ways in which we kind of uh, give away how we feel about a topic without uh, necessarily being aware uh, that we're giving away how we feel about that topic. Yeah, that's, uh, that's super, super interesting. Well, I also want to know, how do you respond when people say, well, I searched this bad thing, but that doesn't mean I have that bad attitude. I was just curious about it. Like, yeah, you know, what's your thought on that? So I think in general, I'm kind of looking at anonymous and aggregate geographic data. So I'm not necessarily saying that one particular individual is racist. I'm just saying, so like when I did my first study of measuring racism in the United States, I kind of uh, had that, you know, the N-word was searched the most in West Virginia and Mississippi and Louisiana and Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio and upstate New York. And it is true that in that, and, and lowest in Hawaii and uh, parts of California and uh, parts of Idaho. And it is true that in that data, probably that included, certainly I was in that data, I was searching N-word from Brooklyn to do my research. There were probably some people searching N-word, uh, African-Americans searching the actual N-word for you know, various reasons related to experiences uh, they'd had, uh, but kind of that gets swamped in the data by all the people who are searching for N-word jokes because they really find N-word jokes funny and want, want to read them. So it kind of gets, uh, it tends to be kind of a, a smaller factor and probably makes it difficult to draw individual level conclusions just based on, on, one, on at least one search. Uh, but kind of usually at, at the area level or time series level, uh, those, those curious searches kind of get swamped in the data by uh, kind of people with a more direct uh, reason for making the search. Right. I guess the way I think about it is that there are many different tools for studying humans. No tool is going to be perfect, but I really like the tool that you rely on because I think it has an interesting set of properties for answering, especially questions that are very hard to ask directly. And, you know, okay, maybe it's not perfect, it's going to have flaws, but like every single one of these tools has flaws. And so it's just a question of what's the best tool to answer what you're trying to answer. And I, and I think I really appreciate the way that you pursue answers to these kinds of questions. So, yeah. So do you want to tell us about um, some of the, the cool questions that you were able to study on that? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so the racism one is how I started. So I basically found that parts of, of 
the country that had the highest racism uh, support Obama a lot less than the previous Democratic candidate, John Kerry. Like, it's just a very, very strong relationship and very robust uh, to all kinds of controls. I, I think it was overwhelming in the data uh, that Obama lost, you know, I said about 4% of the vote just from, from uh, racism, the continued racism in the United States, uh, which when I, when I uh, published the paper was considered pretty shocking. Actually, some people initially didn't publish the paper because they just couldn't believe there was this level of racism in the United States. And they're like, there is no way millions of people are searching for N-word in the United States every year. Uh, remember, after Obama was elected, there's this idea we lived in a post-racial society, uh, that racism was a thing of the past. Uh, but I think it was abundantly clear in the search data that despite what people might be telling pollsters, uh, kind of explicit racial animus was still a major factor in the United States and was really activated by Obama. And then uh, that, that kind of paper, paper just languished for, for a while. Uh, but then when Trump was running for the Republican primary in 2016, uh, Nate Cohn at the New York Times, he's like, Trump's saying all these racist things. Uh, you know, he started his political career by questioning whether Barack Obama, the first African-American president, was born in the country. He didn't repudiate support from uh, members of the KKK. Uh, he retweeted false statistics about af how frequently African-Americans uh, committed crime. Uh, and every time he did one of these things, people said, you know, Trump's just committed this huge gap. His support's about to fall apart, but he does better and better. Uh, does your search data kind of point to a reason for this? Is Trump having support um, among places? Is his support stronger in places uh, with higher racism? So I sent him the data and Nate Silver confirmed it later that it was the single highest predictor of anything they tested in their model for support for Trump in the 2016 Republican primary was basically that Google search indicator I had come up with a few years earlier, the searches for N-word. So kind of Trump's support, uh, Trump's map uh, of support matched almost perfectly uh, Google searches for racism. So I think it's pretty clear that that kind of, ra that kind of racism that, that, that uh, at the time was hidden uh, real racial animus that was really activated by uh, Obama's election uh, was driving Trump's early support. Uh, so, that, so, so that was one, uh, one paper. I've done studies on child abuse. So during, I, I only cho choose cheery topics, but uh, during the Great Recession, there was a drop in reported cases of child abuse, uh, which is kind of surprising because you would think when economic conditions get worse, uh, that child abuse would go up. Many of the risk factors of child abuse are, we think, unemployment, uh, anxiety, anger, alcoholism, all those went up during uh, the Great Recession. But it turns out that child abuse actually went down. And I actually look at data a bunch of different ways. Uh, there are they're like explicit searches. They're, they're really, really sad. Searches like, my dad hit me or my mom beat me. Uh, sad searches by kind of wow. older children. And they went up, like straight up during the recession. And I, I looked at the data a bunch of different ways. And I think it's very, very clear that during the recession, child abuse actually went up while the reporting of child abuse cases went down because uh, basically child protective services were overworked. They couldn't take as many cases. And the people who are most likely to report cases, teachers or firefighters, police officers, uh, they were kind of losing their jobs unemployed. Uh, so they were less likely to report cases. So basically uh, child abuse went up, reporting of it went down. Well, that's a great that's a great example of how this kind of approach can supplement other traditional approaches because you're able to say, well, we want to be able to separate what's being reported from what's actually happening. Yeah, exactly. And it, it seems pretty clear. I've been looking a little bit at this. Other people have been looking a little bit at this, that the same thing happened uh, during the early days of COVID uh, when initially when schools were closed uh, and you know people were in lockdown there was a drop in reported cases of child abuse and domestic violence, but probably a rise in actual cases uh, in part detected through Google searches. Uh, so yeah, that, that is kind of a, a, a good use case, I, I would say, particularly for those direct searches where you know what it means when someone searches, uh, you know, again, these sad searches, my dad hit me or my husband beats me. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty direct kind of uh, statement of, of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Going back to the racism topic for a moment, you were saying that I think that about 4% of the votes you could attribute to racism. Is that right? Yeah. So it's interesting because back then people were like 4%, there's no way that many people are racist was the reaction. But I feel like today the reaction might be the opposite where people might say only 4%, like people are so racist, I would expect it to be a lot higher. And so I guess the question I have for you do you feel like you have any way of estimating how many people are racist according to your definition? Yeah, that, that's tough. 
I don't even know what my definition is. Like, I think racism is such a complicated topic. And my friend was recently complaining we have one word for racism. I think you might, um, among your thousands of fascinating Facebook or Twitter posts, I think you may have had a, a post on uh, the different types of racism. Yeah, I did, yeah. And I totally agree with you. There, there are so many different types of racism, and it's hard to know. Uh, there's searching for, you know, N-word jokes. There's uh, secretly judging African Americans. There's, uh, you know, implicit bias towards African Americans. Uh, there's having violent thoughts towards African Americans. There's all kinds of different ways that racism play out that I think it's hard uh, using any methodology to even settle on a definition, uh, let alone say what percent are that way. And it's also probably going to be a lower bound for various reasons. So I, I said that Obama lost about 4% of racism. That actually means, if you do the math, that about 10% of white voters who, what, who I argue would have voted for a white Democrat did not vote for Barack Obama uh, because mm. the 4% total lost votes. Uh, basically, there's a certain part of the country that was going to vote for the Republican, whether he was black or white. So kind of the 4% comes only among the people who would have voted for Obama to begin with. And that also includes some African-Americans. So it is, I think, a high percent of, of white people who I argue would have voted for a Democrat did not vote for Obama just because he was black, which I think is still, I think even in this day and age, that, that still strikes me as a bit as uh, maybe surprisingly high. Right. Well, yeah, and certainly I think there's been shifting definitions of racism. You know, we've seen, we've seen different books come out that will propose, okay, this is how to think about racism or that's how to think about racism. And I think that makes it all the more complicated because it's at, we're actually in a situation where there's debates happening about what it, when you say racism, what do you actually mean by that? I mean this, and everyone should adopt my definition. So now, now it's just, it's, very, it's a very confusing question to ask how many people are racist. And I think the answers range from everyone to, you know, a few percentage of people, depending on exactly where you draw that line. So Yeah, I think, I think one thing that after I'd done that research, I kind of was thinking, and, and some uh, other sociologists have said this, is that there probably hasn't been enough emphasis on explicit racial animus. Maybe there is now more since Trump has been president and uh, racism has come out of the closet to some degree. But, you know, there was kind of this idea that uh, I think the focus of academic research for, you know, kind of the beginning of the 21st century, uh, I would say, was largely uh, on implicit bias and subconscious bias. And that's the idea that kind of everybody's racist. So, you know, you might not be searching for end word jokes. Uh, and you might not think consciously that African Americans should get worse treatment or that an African American shouldn't be president, but that subconsciously you make these associations between African Americans and criminal behavior or laziness or lack of intelligence. Uh, and I think, you know, that, that's definitely an issue. And, and, uh, but I think, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I, there still is a lot of explicit racial animus in the United States. I mean, people literally search N-word jokes. And you look at like when these searches are rising, uh, one of the periods they rose a lot was during Hurricane Katrina. I don't know if you remember back then, but there were all these like uh, videos of kind of poor African-Americans, like borderline drowning in New Orleans. Oh my gosh. Yeah, at the same time, for, for whatever reason, this activated a uh, racist to make searches like N-word jokes. I guess they were kind of getting off on humiliating black people when they were down. So I, I think, you know, that, uh, that, that, that still is a, a big factor in American life uh, and, and, and has big impacts on things like who people vote for president, uh, probably also on how police treat people and, and many other areas of life. Uh, and it hasn't gotten as enough, uh, probably, probably hasn't gotten the right amount of attention, in part because it's so hard to measure in polls. So polls kind of uh, told us incorrectly that that explicit animus had gone away when it was really always there. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look at some of these longstanding polls that will ask about things that just seem very explicitly racist, like, you know, if someone of a different race, you know, moved ne next door, would you be upset or, you know, these kinds of things, the numbers just went down, 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 and down over the years to the point where, you know, some polling places just stopped running them because you're getting such low numbers of people agreeing. And yet people are still searching for, you know, these horrible N-word jokes when people are dying in tragedies. And it's like, you know, there's, there, there is, I think, a cost to some degree of when we make words change so that they apply to a broader and broader group, which is that, well, on the, on the plus side, that can make us more aware of the biases we all have. But on the minus side, it can obscure the fact that there are some people that actually like have really, really atrociously bad views and lumping them in with people who are much less racist it actually might, may be a bit of a smokescreen that they can hide behind to some extent. What, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, although to be fair, uh, racist searches have also gone down, at least since Google Trends has measured it since 2004. Uh, so even on the, this kind of explicit racism, there seems to be continued progress. I'm going to name drop, but uh, Steven Pinker, uh, we, we kind of became, uh, we, we kind of met and, and uh, ha had a bunch of discussions. And I think we have similar attitudes towards kind of social science and uh, various uh, uh, areas, but he's like a total optimist and I'm a total pessimist. Uh, you know, he wrote this book, Enlightenment Now, about how the world's getting better. And he wrote the book, The Better uh, Angels of Our Nature, about how violence has declined over time. Uh, so, of course, when I saw the Google searches, kind of my bias is always to find probably the, the bad things happening, which legitimately, I think, were there. The, you know, the, the racist, the racism that still exists in the United States and that hurt Obama and helped Trump. Uh, I think uh, Stephen Pinker, interestingly, looked at the data and was like, wow, this has really gone down a lot over time, uh, which is also true. Uh, and, and also has to be pointed out and, and actually has continued to go down uh, during Trump's presidency, uh, partly because I think uh, some racists are dying. Uh, you know, racism, if you look at Google searches aren't broken down by uh, demographics, but you can compare uh, the area level search data to area level demographics. And you definitely see that one of the biggest predictors is age, that places with a lot of older people make more searches for things like N word jokes. So places with a lot of people 65 and older, 80 and older. Uh, and some of these people literally just die over time. So racism, to some degree, is dying out uh, in the United States. Uh, it's dying out. It's not dying out as fast as many of us would like, and it hasn't gone down to the levels that polls uh, might suggest it has gone down to. Uh, but it is it, it it is continually going down in the United States. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's kind of amazing watching movies, even just from the '80s, and seeing like elements of sexism and racism that today we'd be like shocked that that was in a film. And then if you go back, you know, 60 years ago, you know, or 80 years ago, it's like, un it's sort of unbelievable by our standard today, how racist people were. So I think, I think that is good to remember that at least, at least there has been a ton of progress, uh, even if we're, you know, far from being all the way towards a completely equal and just society. For sure. All right. So uh, let's talk about a different topic, which is that of mental health. What, what have you done around that? Yeah, so I've actually been working a, a while on this and I still haven't published it, but I think it's like a super interesting topic. Uh, uh, mental health. So, so actually other scholars have correlated that searches for uh, suicide correlate with suicide rates. So when a lot of people are making searches, again, sad searches, how to commit suicide, suicidal, suicide help, uh, suicide rates in an area tend to go up and the searches are more predictive than surveys asking people if, if they had suicidal ideation. I think that work is incredibly important and really can potentially be used to help save lives in interesting ways. Uh, I got really interested in what people search for before they search for suicide. I thought that's just like a really interesting topic and we could learn a lot about kind of the mind of the suicidal. Uh, there's actually an old data set uh, from 2006 that AOL released to researchers, uh, which has the same individuals over time anonymous. So you can see like someone's three month history uh, of searches and you can, some of these people do make really, really sad searches suggesting that they basically want to take their lives. We don't know if they actually took their lives. That could be kind of another project. Uh, but, and, and some of the searches, search years are just so sad. You, you see like senior citizens, like, like just the window into the mind, the unprecedented window you have in someone's mind from their search behavior. You see citizen, senior citizens searching like, can't pay rent. Uh, how am I going to get housing? Uh, you know, uh, not not enough from social security like all these searches suggesting a senior citizen in deep financial trouble and then like how to commit suicide i want to end my life i mean such a sad series of searches oh my god yeah then you see like some search series that like are just kind of like you know one person that david said again anonymous is just going back and forth like almost all day between searches for like help with severe back pain and a desire to end their life and it's like so sad. It's also just like makes you, I think, more compassionate because like we never know what's going on in someone else's life. So someone may seem like they have everything together. They have a great career. They have a great spouse. But that person may have some health challenge like severe back pain that totally dominates all their waking thoughts and makes them actually suicidal. And, and there was a kind of one search that kind of got me down, a, a, I think, an interesting trail where it was this, you could tell by other searches, kind of this young woman. Uh, who basically searched for uh, that she just di got diagnosed with herpes, uh, the, the sexually transmitted disease, and then she searched that she wanted to commit suicide. Like there was basically just this like you know 
a couple day window where she had just gotten this herpes diagnosis and she was also suicidal. Again, we don't know what actually happened to her. We hope that she did not go through with this uh, suicidal desire. But uh, I, I actually looked in the data and, and herpes and uh, herpes was like, and, and some other STDs, but mo mainly herpes was like a surprisingly common thing to search before someone searched for suicide. That's so surprising given the incredibly high prevalence of herpes. Yeah, uh, yeah, high prevalence of herpes and like, and that it's not, you know, kind of a severe disease that causes great continual discomfort. So something like back pain, I mean, you, you see a search series like that and you understand that person's in like agonizing pain day in, day out. And, you know, we hope that we could get a solution to the problem and that you could see the right doctor or they could find a way to learn to li live with that. But we have some understanding for why uh, that kind of severe condition is causing uh, that, 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 that man to uh, search for ways to end his life. But something like herpes, long term, the prognosis, as you said, it's very common, and the prognosis is good. The symptoms are not severe. You know, it's not life threatening. It shouldn't have a big impact on someone's life. And I actually looked also, this is actually on Google Trends. I, I said, this is kind of weird. I didn't think that, you know, surprising that herpes kind of was causing you know, some, some fraction of people to have suicidal ideation. And I think the reason for that is the stigma, particularly for young people. So I think uh, young people are so confused with how the world works. Uh, and it's kind of, you know, they, they greet many challenges with something like paranoia and feeling like there's something deeply flawed with them and deeply wrong with them and deeply unlovable about them. And the, that, that stigma can cause some fraction of young people to think of ending their lives. So anyway, I went to Google Trends where you can actually see the, what people make in, in a, the same search window that they make other searches. So in a search window, where someone searches uh, herpes and thoughts of suicide, what else do they search in that search in that search window? And I found the number one other search that people searched in that search window was celebrities with herpes. Oh wow! Uh, with, yeah, which actually is a common search for many illnesses. So I, I think it makes sense. Like when you have a health condition, so like I've struggled a lot. I've, I've told a lot of people uh, with depression as an adult, and like I probably searched like twenty times for celebrities with depression. And it's kind of like, oh, you know, Woody Allen suffered from depression or Leonard Cohen suffered from depression, although you could have guessed that from their art. But uh, wh whoever you kind of learn about, you know, Brad Pitt had a depressive episode. Like whoever you learn about has depression because it does make you feel better about, about, about your condition, makes you feel less alone, makes you feel less stigmatized. Uh, so it's a common search for, for many uh, Ill illnesses, kind of looking for uh, people who could be role models who also suffer from that condition. So then I, was kind of, I kind of looked through okay, what happens when you search celebrities with herpes? Now knowing that some fraction of teenagers are getting diagnosed with herpes, searching for suicide, and then searching for celebrities with herpes to make themselves feel better. And I found that like for every other like disease I tested for, for depression, celebrities with depression, lots of celebrities you know, have come out as having depression, celebrities with migraines, lots of celebrities have come out with having migraines, uh, celebrities with cancer, lots of celebrities have come out with having dealt with cancer, like just about any, uh, you know, illness, there are many celebrities who have openly shared that they uh, had this illness, but celebrities with herpes, there's just about nothing, uh, certainly not A-list stars saying that they've had herpes, uh, despite, as you said, herpes being very common. I think it's, yeah, I looked at the prevalence. I think HSV-1 is about 48% of people who are under the age of 50. Yeah. That's an insanely uh, yeah. high prevalence. And like, if you actually look at what comes up when celebrities with herpes, at least when I checked. Like, well, see, it seems like we can reasonably assume that something close to half of all celebrities have herpes. So, yeah. So, like, when you go to celebrities with herpes, I just clicked on the first thing and it says you have famous stars with herpes and STDs. But then all of them, like, it's not the celebrities saying they have herpes, it's that they were accused of having herpes. So, Anne Hesh is the first one, the site I went to. And she was rumored to be a patient of herpes. And like Derek Jeter, it's one of the most controversial topic nowadays that Derek Jeter may have herpes, that he's rumored uh, to be a big source of herpes transmission to his celeb girlfriends, but he's certainly never said he's had herpes. So it just stigmatizes it further, basically, making it seem like some horrible accusation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, Paris Hilton herpes is the biggest rumor in the list of stars living with herpes. The rumor became public due to a prescription she had that was containing a medicine to recover from genital herpes. But it's not like... Paris Hilton, after that rumor came out, said, yeah, I have herpes and it's something that 48% of other people have and it's nothing to be embarrassed about. So I would think that a teenager making that Google search celebrities with herpes uh, would not feel better necessarily about what she found, uh, but she could feel a lot better if some celebrities 
came out and said they had herpes and tried to fight the stigma. I think like literally just from kind of the data analysis that I talked about, I think literally would save lives if some celebrities came out and said that they had herpes and there was nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to be stigmatized. I think that's kind of the power of the data set to kind of uncover thoughts like the teenagers becoming suicidal over a diagnosis of herpes and uh, looking and failing to find uh, celebrity heroes that may feel better about their situation. Yeah, it's such an interesting example. I mean, herpes seems to me like a case where sort of society has gone insane, where it's something that like about half of people have and yet is ex- feels extremely stigmatizing and nobody talks about. And so it's just like, you know, what the heck is going on? There's also this interesting euphemism, uh, which is, you know, having cold sores and people will say, oh, I, oh yeah, I, have, I just have a cold sore or whatever. And it's like people almost don't even put it together that that's just often the same thing. Uh, and yet one of them, you know, is, seems to be stigmatized and the other's like, oh, just a cold sore, no big deal. So I think it's just sort of a collective madness we have around that. Yeah, but I, I, and just in general, like, I was talking about this with a friend recently, like how much of unhappiness in life is having problems that are actually really common that you think are not common or you think, you know, you know, you know, think that you think other people aren't, aren't dealing with in part because other people are usually putting on a front uh, in their public presentation, in social media, in many other areas, people show their best selves. So he's kind of see the, the best selves of other people. And we see the complete, our, our complete self. And we kind of have a distorted view of how life is supposed to go that I think it's very easy to feel like we're a freak or uh, we're, you know, like, yeah, yeah, we're messed up or we're unusually unpopular. I think there are many problems that I think people would be happier if they had an honest view of, of other people's lives, uh, not a distorted view of other people's lives. So I like I actually became happier after analyzing all this Google search data, because I think a lot of my unhappiness is also due to feeling like, you know, messed up in some horrible way or other people have it so easy and I have it so bad. And it's kind of like when you look through search data and you see that, okay, life is a struggle for most people much you know some of the time it can kind of relieve some of the pressure that, that we can feel yeah it reminds me of two quotes that both of which i like a lot the first is don't compare your insides to other people's outsides right yeah it's like you know people other people are constantly like trying to project something to the world and your own life you experience from the inside right without the all the marketing on top of it the second one is be kind because everyone's fighting a great battle and I just think it, that's really true that almost everyone has some kind of problem in their life. And unless you know them really well, you probably don't know what it is. And it could be minor, you know, they have a little bit of trouble sleeping, or it could be major, like they're considering killing themselves or, you know, a family member of theirs is dying or- They have horrible back pain or something. Yeah, exactly. Like constant, horrible, horrific back pain or something. Yeah, exactly. So I think these are, these are both, you know, good reminders. <laughs> uh, and a lot, of, a lot of what we experience that is bad is very, very common, yet people don't talk about it. It's, it's I think we'd be a lot better off if people were more comfortable publicly sharing these kind of things that are stigmatized that are really common so that others realize, hey, you know what? Like almost everyone has something like this, if not exactly the same thing. Um, so there isn't so much reason to be embarrassed. That is true. Though, to be honest, I thought that I was going to lo- like look through Google search data and find out that I was actually like really normal. The things I thought were weird about me aren't that weird. And I would say like the search data just made me feel a little weirder. <laughs> I would never describe you as normal sets. So. Yeah, no. <laughs> you didn't need to see search data to, to confirm that. But, but, so there's, there's also just like, I, I agree, like I, I was kind of making that point, you agree that like th- there are things that are really common, like herpes, or, you know, another one I talk about in the book is homosexuality, you know, that, that I estimate maybe 5% of, of men are gay. Uh, so, you know, and, and definitely so, someone should not feel bad. I, I think we both agree or all, you know, that, that, that they were, uh, you know, that they, they were attracted to members of the same sex. Uh, but I don't think the reason for that is because 5% of men are gay. Like if 1% of men are gay or one in a thousand men were gay, it still, I, th- I think, shouldn't be wrong to be gay. Of course, yeah. Uh, and, you know, if, if, if someone had some health condition that wasn't shared by 48% of the population, if it was only shared by you know, 1% or less of the population, still, we, we would hope, wouldn't be a reason to, to kill themselves. So I think, uh, yeah, it is important to keep in mind that, that other people tend to share many of the struggles. Uh, we share, but it's also the particular struggles. Some of the struggles we share, we have may be uh, rare, and that still doesn't uh, make them bad. Absolutely. It's fine to have your, your unique struggles, for sure. I think it just what I was referring to is more around like embarrassment. So if, yeah. if you're dealing with something that like actually is super common, I think that helps us feel less embarrassed about it because, you know, it's like, oh, well, other people are also dealing with the same thing, right? Yeah. 
but but I but I totally agree. Obviously, but yeah, but I'd say that it also should. It would be nice if we also could be not embarrassed of it. We wouldn't feel shamed about having some condition or or whatever that's only one in a thousand. Although I agree, it does help. I think it it is harder. Uh, it, we are probably more prone to embarrassment when we think something is rare. Absolutely. If you'd like to reflect on your values and identify what sorts of things you value intrinsically, there's a useful and completely free tool for that at clearerthinking.org. There are lots of things that people value, career success, friendship, family, having fun. But intrinsic values are special because they are our most fundamental values. We value them for their own sake, and we would continue to value them even if they caused no other effects. Now, like most people, you're probably not aware of all of your different intrinsic values, even though they may be influencing your behavior and goals in numerous ways. So at Clearer Thinking, they've made a test to help you identify your intrinsic values. Taking the test will help you to figure out your most important intrinsic values, discover what your unique intrinsic values say about you, and understand why intrinsic values are so important. You can find the intrinsic values test as well as many other tools and many courses on clearerthinking.org. Okay, so let's talk about your next book. What's, how does your, your up and coming book differ from your last one? Uh, yeah, so my next book is about how you can use data to make better life decisions, which I know is uh, actually frighteningly similar to some of the work that you do, uh, which is uh, you know, kind of more evidence-based decision-making. I actually, I came up with the idea, it was after I wrote uh, Everybody Lies, so the theme of everybody lies is how you can't trust what people tell you. You have to look at their actual data, like behaviors. And after I wrote Everybody Lies, like I asked people kind of, what, what did you like about the book? And everyone's like, I like the sections on racism or child abuse. Like it was really important to uncover that. But Kindle actually now tells you what lines are most underlined in your book, which is like a different, I would argue, more honest source of data. And I went through the data on Kindle and I found out, I found that like, people just underline things with how they can improve their life. Like, how can I date better? Anything that relates to how can I date better? How can I be happier? Uh, you know, how can I lose weight? Or if I hinted at it at all, how can I become richer? Like anything in that domain uh, was incredibly popular with people, despite what they said. I think there's some tendency to downplay how narcissistic uh, everybody is and how much people are looking for ways to improve themselves rather than, let's say, learning about the world or improving the world. Uh, so I would say my second book is just playing completely into this somewhat secret narcissism in people, which is just how, how they can use data to make better life decisions. Uh, well, I love that you applied your own methodology to your own book. And, uh, yeah. and all you narcissists out there, this is the book for you. Go buy yeah. it. Yeah. When is it coming yeah. out? Scheduled probably at the beginning of 2022. Okay, awesome. I'll hopefully be timed around New Year's, kind of play, I think, uh, fits some people's New Year's resolutions, uh, I hope. But I think, like, uh, kind of, kind of the, the broader thesis that I have is that, like, if you think, so if you think of the book Moneyball, uh, so Moneyball uh, famously was about how the Oakland A's transformed baseball by basically uh, using data instead of kind of traditional methods or traditional scouts, kind of your intuition is flawed and data can find out who's really a good player or what, where people should really stand on the infield. And sometimes you do things that feel ridiculous, but actually are right. So, uh, so, you know, the shift has become really popular in baseball. I know Spencer, this is my favorite fact about Spencer, but I think he doesn't enjoy it as much as I do is your grandfather. Oh yeah. My grandfather was Hank Greenberg. Who's like, the greatest Jewish baseball player in human history and in, in history. But uh, yeah, you'll probably cut this out of the, of the talk. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Every time we're at a party, I bring this up and Spencer gets uncomfortable. Well, the so. problem is I will occasionally encounter people who like can cite all the different statistics about him and makes me feel yeah. slightly sheepish. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Hammer and Hank. Uh, but, but so now baseball has kind of been transformed due to Moneyball. Uh, like, you know, if you watch a baseball game, when I, when I watched baseball growing up, like the infielders all stood largely the same place on every play. The third baseman, you know, it was a few feet from third base, you know, shortstop in between third base and, and second base, et cetera. And now like infielders are all over the place. They're in the short outfield. They're in different places with different hitters. Uh, and it seems crazy, like, you know, that you have these situations, these shifts where people are like, you're leaving so much of the field open. How can that possibly be a good idea? It, it feels crazy, but it actually is right. So like, so that kind of motivated me like, so that's like Moneyball baseball, but I think in our big like life decisions, 
we tend to kind of still go based on our intuition. So if we're picking a partner, deciding who to marry, or trying to be happy, or picking a career, I would argue that most of us largely rely on our intuition and don't do database things and don't do things that feel wrong, like shifting the infielders, uh, but might actually be right, be justified by the data. So I've kind of just spent the last couple of years just kind of talking to people, doing my own research, but largely kind of uh, talk to other people, trying to find research in kind of these big areas of life. What have we, we uncovered with all, all, all the enormous data that we're now accumulating about human beings? Kind of what have we learned about these big life decisions that might help people make better life decisions and even do things that don't feel necessarily right, but might actually be right? I heard that you had some results about parenting and how we can use data to parent better. Yeah, so parenting's uh, an interesting area. So like the first kind of counterintuitive thing about parenting, this has been covered by a lot of people, is they've done a combination of twin studies and adoption studies. So the twins, they compare, they, you compare like identical twins and fraternal twins, you kind of can break down and you kind of compare the outcomes and you can use this, there's kind of a formula where you can say how much of an individual's, let's say income is driven by their genetics versus the environment they grow up in versus other factors. And then adoption studies, you can kind of compare Okay, there have been like random, some, some, some programs where they've literally randomly assigned adoptees to households and you can say, okay, well, how do different people from who were just happily randomly assigned to the same household, how similar are their outcomes? And it turns out when you, when you do this analysis, basically like parenting matters, I think a lot less than most people expect. And there have been books written about this. Judith Rich Harris wrote a book about this. I think Brian Kaplan has written about it. So like the, 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 the general studies is like, the kind of where you grow up, the house you grow up in, the best possible place to grow up, like with, with the, you know, the best family, whatever it is that makes a home great, uh, maybe adds like 15% to your income, uh, which isn't a huge amount. It's not as much as, as many would expect. And that includes everything that a parent does, where, they, where they're, they're raising the kid, uh, whether they read to the kid, you know, or how much they read to the kid, uh, you know, where they send, what school they send them to. You know, they, whether they swaddle them with their babies, how they feed them, just like everything that goes into that, about 15% addition to income. So with that result, that also applies across a whole bunch of outcomes. It's not just income, right? It, it, it depends. So some outcomes you can influence more. So education, parents seem to be able to influence more than income. So parents can kind of help put their kid into a more elite university, but they have a harder time having their kid earn more money as adults. You know, and you could probably imagine reasons that may be true. Uh, they can, you know, help with the college essays, maybe, but you can't necessarily make them a better employee uh, for many years at a company. Parents influence different variables in different amounts, but generally, yeah, most things, uh, parents influence kids less than we would expect. Right. And, and so my understanding is you can break this down into kind of three segments of influence. Yeah. The first is genetics, yeah. which you, you know you give to your kid. Uh, the second is the shared environment, which is yeah. what would be, you know, if you have two children what's in common between their experience, right? Yeah. Like your parenting style and the house you live in and the neighborhood you grew up in, whatever. And then yeah. there's a non-shared environment, which is sort of the leftover, whatever is left over that's not part of genetics and not part of the shared environment. Is, exactly. that, is that the right way to break it down? Yeah, and, I, and the general idea is that parenting matters less, uh, the shared environment matters less than we think. And both kind of genetics matter a ton. And then also random things, the, the third group matter more than than people suspect and we don't really understand why. So for example, if someone's schizophrenic and if someone's schizophrenic and they have an identical twin uh, raised in the exact same household, so that person shares the same genetics, they're identical twins and the same shared environment, they're, grow they, they're raised in the exact same place, they're not 100% likely to be schizophrenic. I think it's something like 50% schizophrenic. So there's a 50% chance if you have a, a, a pa parents raise identical twins in the same place, uh, and one of them is schizophrenic, that the other one isn't going to be schizophrenic. So what caused that? How did, you know, th that's kind of like a wildly different uh, psychological outcome uh, that was caused by something mysterious that's not genetics and not the place they were raised. So uh, that's really, really interesting and, myst and mysterious. Like psychologists still haven't really figured out exactly what's going on there. Yeah, I find that, I find it really interesting. And I also wonder about this variable of like non-shared environment, because for example, I am definitely aware of parents that treated their two different children really differently. And I think that would come into the non-shared environment rather than the shared environment. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. So one thing they think, like even with identical twins, is that parents treat their kids. Like, so so the, the, having the same parents is considered the shared environment, not the non-shared environment. 
But one of the things that may be the, the reason that, that a shared environment comes scores low and non-shared environment scores high is because even though we share the same parents, as you say, or the same, same households, two people share the same parents, same household, they are treated differently. So even identical twins, uh, maybe want, they show slight differences for some random reason, and then the parents start treating them differently because of those differences, and then the differences get bigger and bigger, and there's kind of like a, you know, a little bit of like chaos theory, a slight initial difference can lead to uh, big differences down the line. They kind of get reinforced in, 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 in important ways. Right. And then they can end up in different friend groups and then all kinds of influence occurs from that and yeah. uh, and so on. But I, I have to say that I, I have some skepticism around this research. Like, I think you described it accurately and it seems to be the scientific consensus. But I'll tell you where my skepticism comes in, which is it seems really clear to me that a parent can ruin a child. Like if a sufficiently bad parent, it seems like can damage a child permanently uh, or at least like at least for many, many years. And I don't know how to square that away with this. I mean, unless maybe the argument is that that just happens rarely enough that it doesn't affect the shared environment that much, or that parents damage their children differently. Like, you know, maybe they damage one of their children, but not the other. And that would explain it. Uh, what do you think about that? No, I think that's totally the case. I mean, there are extreme examples where you have parents that like raise their kids as slaves or something. And, you know, you, those kids are, are, I think, just about 100% of the time, completely messed up. I think uh, largely they would say that that's kind of, you know, included in, in, the, in the variance. So if anything, that makes the effects, like the positive effects, smaller, because it also includes, like, the, the overall variance that's caused by parental outcome uh, also includes, like, these extremely negative outcomes. So there is some effects of parents that includes, presumably, the, ne the negative effects and include some of the positive effects. So, that, so the extent that there are extreme negative effects, uh, maybe the positive effects would be even smaller uh, than a kind of a, a neat, naive translation from variance to kind of you know, top outcomes would suggest, if that makes sense. So I guess it, it suggests that there's not, if it's both true that parents can really ruin their children, and it's true that there's very little influence, relatively speaking, of the shared environment, it suggests that perhaps it's just not that common that parents ruin their children, is that, is that right? And that the ruining, like the other ruining that we think, like my mom hugged me too much or was too, you know, too attached to me or things that, you know, like that are probably not, maybe not as, you know, don't, don't have as big effect as we think. I don't know. So like the, the ruining is, is more, I, again, I think there clearly are cases where, you know, li literally abuse does ruin people, but maybe, you know, extreme abuse does ruin people, but it's not that common that that extreme, real extreme abuse that, that's, that, that would ruin people. Another thing about this, and this is more speculative. But it seems to me like it probably is possible to make kids much better off if we like understood how to do it. Like even if it's true that right now the shared environment doesn't have that huge a consequence, like it doesn't mean that theoretically it couldn't have a huge consequence. Like it doesn't mean that we couldn't one day discover how to do amazing parenting that like leads to incredibly, you know, high well-being, emotionally stable children or something like that. Totally agreed. One place to start is probably using some of these studies and finding, like zeroing in on the 99th percentile parents uh, and figuring out what, what they did. Yeah, that would definitely be, that would be a promising uh, area of research. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Because there's this interesting distinction between what's the average kind of variance caused by this versus what could it be? Or like what, you know, how long could we make it? And a small average variance might mean it's hard to do, but it doesn't mean, you know, it can't be done. So um, I think that's all, also uh, just, just worth flagging. I, you know, one, one third thing before we switch to another topic, I just want to mention about this. It also seems to be true that people are often indoctrinated by their parents. So, you know, if their parents are diehard, you know, ex-believer, whether that's a religion or a philosophy or whatever, clearly their children are way more likely to be a diehard ex-believer than, you know, a random person who wasn't raised in that household. And I wonder how that squares with this. Is it just that the outcomes that we're looking at here are things like, let's say, income or personality or whatever? Are just not that related to these kind of like these. Yeah, and I, I think I, I'd have to check, but I think political and religious views do have a higher, you know, parents can influence their kids more in those dimensions than they could income or some of these or personalities or some other traits. Yeah, sure. Like a sports team, you know, which sports team you like, you know, that would almost be a sanity check for some of these studies. Uh, does uh, parent, you know, shared environment influence the sports team? Shared environment, which would include both the place you're raised and you know at who, who your dad may root for or mom may root for uh, it would be hard to imagine that wouldn't have an enormous effect but there's actually a second point on on parenting so like the first general idea is that shared environment doesn't matter that much uh, there's also a recent literature 
uh, I don't know if you've, you've followed it, by Raj Chetty and some of his co-authors, where they've gotten access to kind of com comprehensive IRS data for a long period of time in the United States. And they, like Raj Chetty has just published one groundbreaking paper after another using this data. Uh, it's such a powerful data set and really hasn't been hadn't been used uh, much before uh, kind of he and his, his, his co-authors uh, got their hands on it. And they did this study on the effects of neighborhoods on, on children. Uh, and one of the things they could do with their study, so, so we know that you know, kids who grow up in certain neighborhoods earn more money or have better life outcomes on various dimensions, uh, but it's hard to know how much of that is causal. So you know, if someone grows up in Beverly Hills, we'd probably expect that they probably would have higher income than someone who grows up in boondocks of West Virginia, but there's probably a lot going on there, uh, not just the actual place they grew up. So he did this interesting study where he's, because the data, he has the comprehensive data on so many people, you know, he's talking about tens of millions of Americans, he could really zoom in on basically parents that moved uh, while their kids were at different ages. So parents who moved from kind of one location in the United States to another, particularly when kids were at different ages. So maybe they have two kids, one of them's 15 and one of them's five, and they move from one town to another. And basically, if you think about it, you can use that data to really disentangle exactly how much the neighborhood matters by seeing how the five-year-old on average compares to the 15-year-old. So if, the, if every time someone moves to a particular town, the five-year-old does way better than the 15-year-old, we'd expect that, 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 that we'd basically say that, that that location has to be helping kids in, in ways. Does that make sense? That's a cool methodology. I like it. Yeah. So basically, what he found... Uh, when he did this, and you actually can, if you actually do the math, you can actually get a, not just find out how, how much different places matter, but exactly how much each year matters. So the year between zero and one, one to two, two to three, all the way up to whatever age, I think he stops at 20 or something. And he finds surprisingly large effects of the place you're raised. So like I've done the math and I think being raised in the best place, uh, the best location uh, on average would add about 10% to your income. So like kind of comparing the same, if the same kid, if the same family, one kid got raised in a kind of what, what would be the best place according to this methodology, and one kid uh, was in an average place, uh, that kid would get about 10% higher income. So I think that these two literatures, the one we talked about first, kind of the overall effects of shared environment, which is small, and the Raj Chetty and co-authors work, which shows that neighborhood effects are big. And neighborhood's just part of shared environment, right? It's like one facet of it, yeah. Yeah, so it's like a subset of shared environment. It's really interesting. It basically says that the biggest decision a parent makes by far, at least on income, he hasn't tested all the outcomes of like, so, you know, uh, you know, at least on income and maybe a couple others, the biggest effect a parent will make by far is the neighborhood you raise a kid. So like, if you kind of put everything you could put together into the, into the you know, the 15% shared environment bucket, mentioned them earlier, you can think of a lot more. Everything you do a parent, everything a parent stresses about, talks to their friends, you know, reads books, what should I do, what should I do? I would argue that probably everything you do besides where you live probably adds up to less of an effect than just where you live, which I think is really interesting and, and probably something that parents don't think enough about. And I think one of the reasons for this, so he's also, Chetty and, and his co-authors have also found adult role models seem to play a really big role in what kids end up doing. So for example, they found that a young girl who moves to a neighborhood with a lot of adult female scientists, uh, he measured that by, by combining the IRS data with patent records, is much more likely to become a, a scientist when she grows up. So if you raise your daughter very close, and, and Chetty's found also the effects to be hyper-localized, you know, really small neighborhoods, if you're raising your daughter around a lot of female scientists, she's going to become much more likely to become a scientist herself. Uh, African Americans do much better. African American boys do much better if they grow up on the block of black fathers. Not e even their own black father. That matters. But what, what matters seemingly even more is how many black fathers are they growing up around? Are you giving your young black boy great black male role models? Uh, I think, you know, I, you could kind of imagine that one of the reasons it's probably so difficult for parents to have a huge impact on our kids is the parent child relationship is so complicated. So, you know, a lot of the advice you give your kids, kids will sometimes take it and sometimes they'll rebel against it. So if you're a scientist, they may go through a period where they say, well, I don't want to be like my mom. I want to do something different, you know, or, or you know, you know, a lot of kids kind of have complicated relationships with their parents and can 
sometimes do the opposite of what their parents are trying to encourage them to do. But the relationship with your neighbors is pretty uncomplicated. I think most kids view their neighbors as pretty cool. So you can kind of maybe almost trick your kids in parenting style by outsourcing it in various ways. So don't try to lecture them on what to do, uh, but get uh, kind of show them the way of other people you want them to emulate as adults. Oh, that's really interesting stuff. I, I guess I'm wondering how much skepticism do you think we should have of this research? Because, you know, when I hear stuff, like, for example, when I hear results around the non-shared environment versus shared environment, you know, it does, it does get my alarm bells tingling of like, hmm, should I really believe this? Like, it's a super counterintuitive finding, right? And I love the methodology of this new research you've been describing. It sounds really promising because it allows you to control for a lot of variables. But I also do wonder, like, you know, should we view this as like a tentative finding? And then, you know, before we, we jump to conclusions about it, or what's your thought on that? I think we should basically always be Bayesian, which I think is something you'd probably agree with. Would I say that like neighborhoods raise your income by 10% and shared environment raises it by 15%? Exa- those are exactly the correct numbers. I probably would say no. Uh, again, I, I agree with you. Maybe they're a little counterintuitive, uh, a little stronger than, than I'm willing to believe. Would I update my priors based on this research? Yes, I'd say probably based on, you know, what, based on, on, on those two literatures, I'd say the effects outside of the neighborhood you pick are probably smaller than I would have previously thought had I not read this material. And the effects of the na- your neighborhood are probably larger than I would have guessed had Ross Chetty and his co-authors not done those studies. I think that's a great way to look at it. It's sort of like, okay, you've got some prior and this is some more information. You shouldn't necessarily flip to believing it 100% if you originally strongly disagree with it, but you should be now more in the camp of like, okay, maybe this is true, uh, you know, and, and maybe less confident if you, if you used to believe the opposite. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, 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 again, I think that's the way to approach, to deal with like all social science research, especially since there's so much difficulty replicating social science research, unless it's a Spencer study. Spencer's the only one who fully moved my priors. Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm sure some of my studies are, are wrong. <laughs> I, I wish I knew which ones and then I would correct them. But yeah, but I, I think like that, you know, anytime you, you read a study, you, you, you don't, you, I think you never go 100% to that study. You just, if your, pri- if your prior is different, you don't go, you know, move 100% towards that study, but you do adjust. And then how much do you adjust? Well, based on, you know, how, how much do you trust the researchers? How much incentive do you think they had for a splashy finding? I uh, have people try to replicate it. You can do all kinds of, you know, all kinds of factors that determine how much you adjust. And the rigor of the research and like, you know, is it a randomized control trial versus, you know, just a longitudinal study and so on? Yeah, my friend once did a machine, he tried to do a machine learning analysis of whether psychology studies replicate. And he found that only two variables explained everything. And it was basically social psychology studies. That was a negative variable. And studies by Kahneman and Tversky were a positive variable. And that was it. (laughs) That's pretty funny. Yeah, there was some replication where they did like, I don't know, 13 or something papers. And I think all the Kahneman and Tversky ones like panned out, which was was nice to see. On the question of, you know, do parents have not that much effect on their children? I think one thing that's worth keeping in mind is even if this research is true and you're not going to have a huge impact, let's say, on your child's income or something like that. It may well be the case that you're going to ha- you will have a huge impact on your relationship with your child, right? So how you treat your child and the interactions you have with them could vastly affect, you know, whether you have a good relationship with them when they're older and how well you get along when they're living with you and so on. So this still could be a strong reason to care a great deal about how you interact with your child, even if it's not going to cause them to, you know, earn a significantly larger amount, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. Although even that's complicated, you know, I have acquaintances who don't talk to their parents where, you know, the things they've described to me, it doesn't sound like they were off the charts, negative parents. You know, I think they tried their best. So, so kids do go through kind of angry, rebellious stages, sometimes independent of what you do. So that, that may be another area where the effects of shared environment turn out to be smaller than we would have predicted. But I think another thing about this research is small effects don't mean it doesn't matter. It, it, they didn't find zero effects. So uh, if you care about and presumably most parents do, having a good relationship with your kids, even if the effect isn't that huge, most parents would probably want to do just about everything they could to maximize the odds that they get the outcome they want. Same even with income, it could be that you can only increase your you know, education or income or psychological health by a small amount. But I think parents care so much about how their kids turn out that they still would want to devote a lot of time to trying to do everything right. Yeah, good point.
Could the act of answering open-ended questions about yourself give you new, important insights? It turns out the answer is yes, if those questions are selected in just the right way. After running a series of five scientific studies, Clearer Thinking has discovered a specific set of practical, yet rarely asked questions that 83% of people reported were valuable for them to answer, and 78% said they would recommend to others. A remarkably high 88% of people even reported that they enjoyed answering these questions, and Clearer Thinking is now making those questions available to you for free on clearerthinking.org so that you can benefit from them as well. You can also order a beautiful physical card deck of the life-changing questions so that you can use the questions to bond with friends and family. We think you'll be surprised just how valuable answering these open-ended questions about yourself can be. To answer the free life-changing questions or to find Clearer Thinking's other free tools and mini-courses, head to clearerthinking.org. So what can you tell us about how to date better using data? Uh, so I'm, I'm still working on this chapter as we speak. Uh, this is largely summing up research from uh, other scholars who've studied online dating sites. So again, I think the theme of this book is going to be how much new data there is to study people. So we didn't have comprehensive IRS data 15 years ago, so we couldn't study how much each neighborhood matters for a kid. And we didn't have comprehensive online dating data, so we couldn't, we couldn't learn things about kind of better ways to date. Uh, so my favorite finding, uh, you might have already heard this one, but my favorite finding in the dating arena is that like they've done studies of who does well in online dating, me measured in different ways. How many messages do they get? Do they get, you know, do the people they like, like them back? And like, if you look at the most successful online daters, I think they've actually, they've, they've done articles where they've actually shown, I think they've collaborated with like OkCupid and they've shown like the six or seven, you know, most successful online daters. And I'd say that the absolute top of online dating success is exactly who you'd expect. So they're conventionally gorgeous, gorgeous people, perfect shape, great bodies, you know, aesthetic appeal. They have these quirky, fun play profiles. Like they check all the marks that I think we traditionally have thought uh, make someone an attractive mate. So there's no real surprise there. But then, uh, so Christian Rudder wrote this book, Dataclism, which is excellent about kind of what he learned from OkCupid okay dating data. He found that a, a group that does surprisingly well, not as well as the Natalie Portman and Brad Pitt's of the world, uh, but better than just about anybody would expect, is women with shaved heads, which is pretty shocking. Heterosexual women with shaved heads do really well in online dating sites, which is pretty surprising. Uh, I don't think most people think of women with sha heterosexual women with shaved heads as, as sex symbols, and I don't think most people would think that that's a, a, a smart approach to dating. So what's going on? And I think what, what Brother discovered was that a really important factor in how well you do in dating is not just the mean of how other people think of you, how attractive other people find you, but the variance. So having a high variance can be really good because really in dating, you don't want a lot of people to think you're okay. Uh, and if you're not Natalie Portman or Brad Pitt, you're gonna struggle for everybody to think you're you know, really attractive for a huge number of people to think you're really attractive. But you can increase your variance so that some people will be really turned off with you. So a woman with a shaved head, probably a lot of people who see them on uh, OkCupid okay, or Tinder or Zoom just like immediately say no and you know kind of almost laugh at how unattractive they are and how ridiculous they look. But some small group of people is going to be really, really, really into them, uh, which is kind of, I think, underrated in dating, kind of having a, a small group that you really appeal to. And I think that that is really counterintuitive, where I think people, to try to make themselves more attractive mates, frequently try to make them more conventionally acceptable to a lot of people. So you try to dress in a more conventionally attractive way or have a more conventionally attractive haircut uh, or have a more conventionally attractive personality. And I think people probably underestimate the success rate of a strategy that's uh, more about kind of getting an extreme reaction to you that could be extremely negative, but could also be extremely positive. So one thing that, that reminds me of is this idea that the lower the mean is, the higher the variance would actually be desirable. Right. So if you were the most, if you were super, super attractive to the average person, like increasing variance wouldn't actually help you. But if on average people didn't find you that attractive, then increasing the variance would actually substantially increase the number of people that find you attractive. Is that right? That's a great point. Although Natalie Portman, I, I'm pretty sure it did also shave her head for one period of life. And I think she was still incredibly attractive to everybody. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think that's a, that, that is a great point. That, that makes a lot of sense. So I've also analyzed data from Pornhub, which, which I talked about in Everybody Lies. And I think one of the things that that I think 
is striking and in, in kind of, or, which kind of gives like an unvarnished view of physical attraction. What, what do people really desire? And I think I was kind of shocked by how much variance there is in what people find attractive. So that plays into why uh, one with a shaped head does well, because there are, you know, we might think every man, you know, when they're heterosexual men, when they're at their computer uh, and really saying what they deep, what their deepest fantasies are, would search for a woman with a full head of hair. Well, no, some are, uh, you know, a good percentage are searching for a woman with shaved heads. And, and you see this in many dimensions, whether weight, you know, uh, you know we, we think conventionally attractive is being thin. Well, a, a large number of people are searching for really heavy people. And on anything you think of, there's kind of more variation that we sometimes think of in what people find attractive. I think there's also a sense in which people are attracted to characters in, in interesting ways, like almost extremes. You know, so someone with a shaved head it has a really, sh- it's, it's showing with their appearance and, and possibly with their personality as well, uh, like a real extreme personality. And I think when you look at like what people watch in porn or what people fall in love with, it's, it, you have a, bet, a better chance if you're a character in some sense, or like you're, you're, you're extremely something instead of just kind of, you know, meh. Uh, that's an- another reason just in, you know, that, that playing extreme outcomes uh, can be effective. I think this applies in the reverse direction too. Like if you're trying to find someone that's really, really well suited to you, if you're trying to select on the things that everyone is looking for, like if you're trying to select on, oh, I want them to be extremely conventionally attractive, it's actually going to be really, really hard to find someone because you're going to try to find someone 99th percentile conventionally attractive, but so is everyone else. And the competition is just incredibly demanding. But if you can find some trait that you find really, really attractive and higher and higher levels of it are even better for you that most people don't care about then you might actually be able to find some of the 99th or even higher percentile on that trait. And that's incredibly good for you with very low competition. Yeah, well, yeah, my friend had said, said this thing that I thought was really interesting. Who are people you're unusually attracted to? Like, the, or, you know, have traits that you find unusually, are usually into. And, you know, what, who are people who find you unusually attractive and then find that like sweet spot, like where that Venn diagram overlaps uh, is a great place to be to date. Uh, yeah, I think I totally agree. There have been studies which are looking at kind of what correlates with uh, long-term happiness in relationships. And I think it's pretty clear in the data that conventional attractiveness does not correlate with long-term happiness, that two, three, four years down the road, you're not any more likely to be happy if you're with a partner who's in the 99th percentile of looks or the 98th percentile or the 70th percentile, uh, that, that other things seem to correlate uh, much more with happiness. Uh, findings like that, I can get a little skeptical of. They strike me as kind of very politically correct. It's very nice to say looks don't matter and don't think about it. It's, and, and advice like that is, is, is incredibly difficult to follow. If you kind of look for, you know, what most people look for in a, in a partner, people put huge emphasis on looks and no matter, and you, you know, your people can tell you until you're blue in the face that uh, look, looks don't matter and, and people have a hard time you know, following that advice. And, and I think it does make people feel good to say that it doesn't matter, which may, which always makes me a little kind of, I, I'm always a little skeptical of results that, that make people feel good or, or sound good. But I think legitimately there is strong evidence uh, that in a long-term relationship, looks are, are really uh, overrated. Uh, so, so independent of just avoiding the competition, I think just for any, anybody would probably be wise to care less about, uh, about looks. I mean, even if, you're, if you are Natalie Portman or you are Brad Pitt, probably paying attention to the factors that correlate more with long-term relationship success, like you know, the attachment style that a person has or whether they have a growth mindset would be wise compared to trying to, you know, get maximize someone's looks. It seems to me there are a few different reasons why people try to date someone who's good looking. One of them, which seems like one of the usually least valuable to me is because they want to impress other people. Like they want others to see that they're with someone attractive. And it feels to me like, okay, I mean, that's fine. We all want to look good to other people. And so, you know, I don't think there's anything inherently bad about that but maybe it's not the greatest reason to want to date someone good looking. A second is like a sense of identity. Like some people might just say, oh, I'm the sort of person that dates good looking people or, or something like that. And that, you know, it's, so it's more about yourself and it's not directly about like how others are going to view your partner. The third is for sexual attractiveness reasons where, you know, you want to have a good sexual relationship and being with someone that you find sexually attractive, like may enhance that. And then the fourth is kind of like the same way where we like being around beautiful nature or beautiful art. Some people can just find it enjoyable to be around people that they find beautiful in, in a similar way. So I, I would be really interested. I doubt anyone studied this, but I'm really interested to see if it actually matters which, to what extent those four different motivators are coming into play 
And if that affects the effect of someone's physical attractiveness on their like marital or relationship satisfaction. Yeah. I, kids would also be another one since there is a genetic component to attractiveness and the looking good in front of other people is an interesting one too. Cause at least me personally, Larry David always said, I never trust someone whose wife is too beautiful. <laughs> and I kind of feel like I'm a little, so, sometimes I see someone with like a, just like ridiculously like attractive person where I'm like, you know, they met them in another country, but maybe they're happy with them. I, I don't know. Maybe they have a lot of great qualities, but it's to me, it just at least makes me think that they're really insecure in some way. Whereas if I see someone with someone who like, isn't like the most conventionally beautiful person, but like they seem to have a really good dynamic. I, I always think more highly of them. Uh, so I think it's interesting that we think we're impressing other people. And obviously we do impress people to some, to some degree, but I think how people react to the conventional attractiveness you're made is a little more subtle than I think some people might think or realize. There's this rule of thumb for, if you go to like a cocktail party with impressive people, the person you want to talk to is the person who's both poor and not good looking. And that, that's probably the most interesting person in the room. Because they had to overcome the- yeah, because it's like, well, okay, if they're both poor and not good looking, and then there's in this room of, you know, impressive high roller people, like there's probably something really amazing about them that, you know, because they don't have the superficial attributes. So they hopefully have the, the deeper attributes. Yeah, I've heard that. You, I think that Seem Talib said you want to only go to a doctor. Like when you're in a top hospital, find the doctor who looks the least like a doctor, like someone who looks like a butcher or just like looks like a schmuck because, you know, like uh, if he or she had to make, had to uh, have, be a much better doctor because we are so superficial. He or she would have to be, uh, have been a much better doctor to rise to that level than someone who looked like George Clooney. That's really interesting. One day um, when I was in college, I had started a new class in the math building and there was a man standing at the front of the class right before the class was supposed to begin. He was wearing no shoes. He was literally chewing on his tongue and he like had chalk all over his face. And I was like, who is this person? And it turned out, of course, it was, the, it was our teacher, who's a great mathematician. But I, he literally seemed like a crazy person that walked in off the street. And yeah, but he was just, you know, a great mathematician. He didn't give a shit about anything else. So. Math's an interesting one because math, mathematicians, uh, that's funny, but mathematicians, like, there are even examples where people, where like mathematicians have intentionally adopted the weird traits of like John Nash, I think. Like, because I think in math, there's kind of an idea that you're coming across as a weirdo or disheveled or uh, can be an advantage. Uh, certainly it plays into the, the, that's That's my excuse, Seth. That's, that's what I use. <laughs> you're not, come on, you're not to show, but uh, maybe like you want to actually, you want to hire the mathematician who looks like Mitt Romney because <laughs> looking like Mitt Romney might be a bad disadvantage in the world of math where people wouldn't take him seriously because how could someone look like that, uh, you know, really be a good mathematician? I don't know. Do you want to talk about what big data can tell us about happiness? Yeah, so... There's this really interesting project. I don't know if you know it. Do you know the Mappiness Project? It's basically uh, George McCarran, a professor in, Eng in England, has led this project where people basically download an app on their iPhone and they report what they're doing at different times and how happy they are. Oh, nice. And they also report, I think, how anxious they are, and maybe how tired they are, how stressed they are. They're pinged at random times. And it's just like, it's this amazing data set, both because they know what people are doing and how happy they are, and also because it's an iPhone, they can easily get data on where the person is exactly, their latitude and longitude. They compare it, and, you know, they can find it, you know, they compare it in interesting ways to, you know, what's going on in, in that particular environment. So I think it's like this totally revolutionary study of happiness. And they just found all these really amazing things about kind of what, what makes people happy by kind of with, with this data set. So actually, you mentioned that people like to be around a beautiful nature and beautiful stuff. You got, I guess you figured that out without data because that's actually one of the things that they found uh, in the data where you, if you compare the same person doing the same thing at the same time, if they're in a natural environment, particularly near water, water is really valuable, they're much happier than if they're in an unnatural environment. And they've also compared, their, there's another website where, they've, where people have rated the beauty of like every inch of the planet, basically. And they found that if people are in more beautiful environments, they're more likely to be happy, again, doing the exact same thing at the exact same time with the exact same people. But, you know, there's one of the studies I found most interesting, because I'm an enormous sports fan, is their study of sports, where they basically studied how sports fans react to a team's performance, whether the team wins or loses, or they were actually doing soccer, so it was a win, lose, or draw. And they found that 
uh, when you, your sports team wins a bit a match, you gain about four points of happiness. And when your team loses, you lose about 10 points of happiness. Oh man, so it's asymmetrical. <laughs> totally asymmetrical. And it's actually, interestingly, similar to a drug in various ways that people seem to get really excited before a sporting event and then you know, get this, on average, horrible outcome. That, that sports, I think, like if you, uh, I kind of did the math that if you follow, like the most miserable activity, not surprisingly, is being sick in bed. So that's like, if, if someone's sick in bed, that's the lowest happiness they'll report. So like being the fan of three teams, like let's say, you know, I'm a Mets fan, I'm a Knicks fan, I'm a Jets fan. Uh, so if I'm a fan of three teams, like over the course of a year, it's basically the equivalent of being sick in bed for an extra week. Because of the, every time they lose, basically. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, their wins aren't giving me much pleasure and their losses are giving me a huge loss. But if you actually kind of do the math, okay, that's three point loss on average. Uh, compare that to other activities, I'm basically yeah, giving myself, you know, some severe headache for a, a week of a year or something, which is like a pretty, yeah, pretty huge effect. And I go through huge lengths to avoid that level of misery. Certainly, I'm, I'm locking myself uh, in my apartment to avoid COVID, which probably would be the equivalent of a week, of, a sick week in bed for somebody uh, of, of, of my age. Yeah, well, at least, uh, at least your team losing doesn't have a small chance of killing you. So that's an advantage. Or killing my parents. Although my dad's as big a fan as I am, so. Uh, do you think that when people root for teams that um, are less likely to win, that it kind of, even though they're losing more, which hurts more, it might make up for a little bit that when they win, maybe it's even more exciting and they get, you get more of those than those four points? Yeah, I did that study, but it basically, I, I, no, I, sorry, they did that analysis. But basically all that means is there's no way for outsmarting the system. Because you could say, okay, like, so my dad, for example, he was a Mets fan for, uh, most of our, our, our lives growing up, uh, like a huge Mets fan. He, he's, you know, there, there are pictures of him storming the field at Shea Stadium. And he once won, he, one of his proudest achievements was he was a boy. He won a uh, banner day, which was this competition to come up with the most clever banner in supporting the Mets. Uh, and, you know, like just an enormous Mets fan. One of my earliest childhood memories is having him jumping up and down in our house uh, when the Mets won the 1986 World Series. I was four years old, just huge, huge Mets fan. And one day, uh, you know, probably, probably in his 50s then, he switched uh, from a Mets fan to a Yankees fan. This was during the 1990s when the Yankees were uh, a dynasty. And he, he goes, Seth, uh, life's too short to root for a shitty team. Oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's, he's just like, yeah, I, I can't do this. You know, I can't do this anymore. It, it, the Mets have caused me too much pain. Uh, you know, basically thinking, okay, kind of realizing I'm losing all these points, you know, these happiness points when the Mets lose, as they consistently do you know, let me, let me try the Yankees. But if you actually do the analysis, so you explained that the hit is, the, the negative hit is smaller when they lose. It also means the negative hit is bigger when a good team loses. So when the Yankees are really good, the wins give you less pleasure and the losses give you more pain. So basically what it means is there's no way, you know, to escape uh, the trap that rooting for a sports team is going to, on average, hurt your happiness. If only we could believe our team will always lose and then they're actually a good team until they win. That would, that would probably be the, the ideal. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Maybe you could trick yourself. Seth, thanks so much for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks again for listening. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com or you can call and leave us a voicemail at 321-341-4669. To find out more about Spencer, visit spencergreenberg.com. To find out more about Seth, take a look at his bio in the show notes. And to find out more about our show, visit clearerthinkingpodcast.com. If you like the show, we hope you'll rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episode. You can sign up for the newsletter on our website, clearerthinkingpodcast.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.